How are you? Uh, good morning. I'm good. It's day one. Day one. <laughs> day two. Yes. Actually, day one day in two. a lot of ways. <laughs> For our president, it's, I guess it's day two. Day two. It's a good feeling. <laughs> um, <laughs> very strange. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, Larry. Apparently, Trump wrote Biden a very good, a very nice letter. Uh, yeah, have they have, have they released the, the text of it? They haven't released the text of it, but uh, all they say about it is that it's a very, uh, it's a very nice, uh, nice letter, which is oh, not in with. No, he did. He probably didn't write it. Yeah. <laughs> no, but he signed it. They said they would, he didn't want to release it until he passed it through other people. I eventually, I, I imagine eventually it will get released. Uh, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, this. Um, Put underneath this. Yeah. How big? The. Big um, one? No, not. I think, I think he's really afraid of it. Afraid of what? Of the second impeachment. Oh, he should be. <laughs> so you know, he's on his best behavior. Well, I, I, I imagine he's afraid of that. He's also afraid of all of the other indictments that are in process, uh, from New which York. he has no more cover. So. Uh, he will be convicted. In New York, for sure. There's so many different levels of courts that are after him, including including simply Georgia. The, uh, the Georgia State. Because of the phone call or because of other things? Because of his pressure, uh, right. On uh, the Secretary of State. <laughs> that, was, that was so blatant. Oh. <laughs> Whatever he I can imagine. So we have six more minutes of of lashon hara, of. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to make a cup of gossip before we get to the Bible. Hard book. It's very it's technical. It's a hard book. Yeah, Mel thought it was a piece of cake because he's an engineer, so he's used to reading texts like that. For me, it was hard. Uh, chapter three, which we're certainly not going to get to, uh, I found difficult. I have to read chapter three again. Chapter four, I found easier. Uh, so um, a, a lot of it, well, we'll talk about it, but a lot of it is that I we can't get it. reading the Bible. No. Should we do it in the other room? In, um, in the computer there? Be there? Yeah. So I see slowly but surely we're uh, uh, accumulating uh, par our participants. And if we can see your face, that would be great. It would be better if I can get um, quite a good picture of your hand. Let's go to the other room. Good morning, Jonathan. Joan. Good morning, Rabbi. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I have ten twenty six. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot to cover. Um, so there it is. Where? On your... I know I want right, here. My wife said that we're going back to eating dinner in the dining room. Dinner, dinner. Because hurt. for the last several weeks we've been eating dinner in front of the TV. It's <laughs> nice to wake up and not and not look for how much the world will fall apart. That there's somebody at the helm that's gonna guide us. Uh, I watched a little bit of Fox Fox TV last Fox News, and they called the speech boring. And I, <laughs> how terrific! I'm so glad. It was boring. Yeah. 
Well, I have to say that uh, I spent much more time watching uh, movies, concerts, and lectures than I did news over the last uh, month. Well, I got to tell you, just like um, Watergate, I, 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 all right, I don't know who's, who's, uh, Sounds of who that is. Would you tell Fred that I'm tuning in right now to the rabbi's class, all is well. I sent him okay. an email as well. Still have a couple of minutes. The link. It's nice to wake up and not wonder what's happening last night. Absolutely. Okay. What did he do now? <laughs> what is that? Uh, it's got to be somebody's computer. I don't know who's. Somebody's microphone is going crazy. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, Lee. Good morning, Susan. Um, Hello. Uh, Vic, I have you in two different places. You do. That's why well, that's I'll, I'll get one. off of the other. I'll get, I'll get off the other one. That's probably the reason that. Um, yeah. The feedback. That, that getting the feedback. Are you? I was looking the screen. You're not there. I'm there. Um, yeah, we're gonna turn it. Still on two. I want to get off of this. Address? No. There. Okay, I think you're off. Now Good. we're off. Yep. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning. Good morning, Ron. He's saying hello. To get the book. Hi, how are you? Barbara Stevens, but I can't see you. External. Uh, good morning, Phil. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Priscilla. Oh, good. Oh, By the way, Priscilla, I did sign up for the um, uh, the class with. Um, Elevatic. Elevatic. Did, did you hear I, love his first class. I can't hear. He's no. wonderful. He's just. I, I love his first class. Yeah, very, very entertaining and and very informative, and he just covers a whole range when he comes. But that to shouldn't matter. Topics, yeah, great stories. Yeah, great. Thank you. Rabbi. Oh, so let me Good do morning. It. Good morning, Bruce. Uh, as I was reading the book, <laughs> it it brought me back to when I was teaching. And I, I taught a course in consumer behavior, consumer psychology, right. and I almost always started the class with a statement, there is no such thing as reality, <laughs> only people's perception of reality. All right. And that was so true of what I was reading. Yeah. Well... It's true. You know, we have this idea that, uh, you know, the Bible is a book like any other book. Um, um, and it's, um, you know, you just read it and you understand it. Uh -uh. Uh -oh. <laughs> this is one of the reasons, we'll get to this later, but one of the reasons that, uh, you know, there's an image of a Protestant home that does Bible reading before at, at dinner. And they just read a, a, a section of the Bible. Jews never do that. Jews don't read the Bible or read biblical text without a commentary. Um, and uh, so just reading the text is not going to, um, gonna, gonna share, gonna, gonna, gonna teach you anything. So I have uh, 1031. So let's get started. Uh, I want you all to sit up straight and be in best behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Put on your masks and be six it, feet away. It says recording, uh, that we are gonna record these uh, these sessions. And that's at the instigation of uh, Eric Osland, who wanted to participate, but uh, work prevents him from participating in some, in some weeks and not in other weeks. So uh, he asked whether it could be recorded. So each week you will not only um, get an announcement on Wednesday about Thursday's class, uh, but also a, um, a connection to the, to the recording. Now, uh, I urge you not to, if you can, to come to class and not simply rely on the recording, because I must tell you, I'm in another class 
and uh, which is on Tuesday mornings at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and uh, I started relying on the recordings and then I got behind. So um, it's better if you, <laughs> <laughs> I urge you to come to class. So, um, so we are being recorded. Um, by the way, it's uh, very interesting um, that we start this class dealing with, um, with the Bible the day after the inauguration, because you, um, uh, in the Times, uh, and maybe the local paper as well, have pictures actually of both our new president and vice president taking the oath on their Bibles. Um, so, um, uh, of course, um, President Biden took his oath on an old family Bible, but he took the oath on a Catholic Bible. Uh, now we're gonna talk about the, about the differences, but the Catholic Bible is different from the Protestant mm -hmm. Bible and different from the, from the Jewish Bible because the Catholic Bible includes the deuter deuterocanonical text, uh, deuterocanonical books, which is um, uh, books uh, from, the, um, um, uh, from the Greek uh, that were not included in the Masoretic text. So I think there are about seven books in the Catholic Bible that are not in our, uh, our, our Hebrew, Hebrew Bible. Um, Kamala Harris, you will notice, is taking a, an oath, if you see the picture, on two Bibles. Um, it's interesting that Kamala's mother was Hindu and her father was, uh, was Christian um, and um, she considers herself a Baptist, even so she's married to a Jewish guy. So I was very interested in, in what the two Bibles were, whether one was hers and one was his, but I think they were both Christian Bibles. One was the, um, uh, the Bible of... Um, Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall's Bible. Um, and the other was a, uh, the Bible of, uh, of someone who, who helped to raise her, that she considered her, her, her second mother. So when we talk about the Bible, we're gonna talk about this a little, in a little bit, we're talking about a, a very complex, it's not a simple, simple subject, even defining what is the Bible. Um, but I want to uh, begin with a, um, um, a personal story um, that um, occurred in my previous congregation. Uh, I was very involved in, in an interfaith group. I was the only Jew uh, in this um, group of, of ministers and, and priests. And um, uh, one day I read in the newspaper that the Baptist minister, who I knew quite well, was hosting an event that was going uh, that was going to be um, uh, a fellow from the Jews for Jesus was going to lead a pa Passover seder. Uh, I was very upset, and I called him up and I said, "If you want to introduce your congregation to the pat to an authentic Passover seder, why don't you call me?" So he said, "Well, they called me and they offered," and I said, "Okay, I'd like to come." Now he got all upset. Uh, because he thought there would be a, uh, a confrontation. I came uh, with a mistaken uh, notion that I was coming incognito. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, the presentation was, um, uh, wasn't terrible, but there were all kinds of things. For instance, uh, I remember his uh, telling everybody that the three matzahs were the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus. Um, that when um, uh, the Israelites daubed the, uh, uh, their doors with blood, they did so in, uh, in the cross. Um, so there were all kinds of Christological things that he uh, did. Yeah. Uh, After the presentation, a woman came over to me and she said, um, she was glad that I was there. And she said, you really ought to read the New Testament. <laughs> so I said to her, I have. And her next comment was very important, and we'll see why in a little bit. She said to me, and weren't you convinced? <laughs> oh. Well, I really didn't know how to, how to respond to that, but it was obviously so self-evident that all you had to do was to be exposed to the text and you would be convinced of its truth. Um, and over the years, not, not in the last several, several years, I used to get 
from various evangelical organizations, maybe it was just one. Uh, I used to get these four color magazines um, and in each one, there was a story about a Jewish kid who was prohibited from reading the New Testament and uh, did so with a flashlight in bed uh, under the covers. Um, and it has the same idea that the reason that Jews don't become Christians is because we are prevented from being exposed to the truth. Um, and I, I looked at those and I thought, you know, I wouldn't prevent my, my, my kids from, from reading the New Testament. I hope that they would read a, a, a section of the New Testament in order to be educated, educated human beings. So um, uh, that story, by the way, I think is going to be a theme for much of what we're going to do. Uh, I hope that most of you were able to get, um, um, were able to order the book, were able to get, uh, to get the book. And even if you didn't, um, uh, we'll, um, we'll follow along. And as I suggested in the email that I sent out yesterday, if you found the, the reading somewhat confusing or, uh, or difficult, if you go back and read it a second time, maybe after our, our class, I think, it, I hope it will be, uh, it will be clearer. So I took a couple of, uh, of, of lines from the text that I think are so vitally important to understand what we're doing. Yeah. So the first one is, uh, in the, uh, near the beginning, Christians read, and listen carefully, Christians read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And Jews read the Tanakh, the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, through the lens of post-biblical Jewish commentaries. In other words, we both have a have a prejudice, and that prejudice is our is our our tradition. Now, the Christian prejudice is really very different than the Jewish prejudice uh, in terms of reading the lens of the New Testament, uh, of of reading the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, and what does um, and what does that really mean? So, uh, um, so there's really the. Uh, in many ways, we read the text separate from its original meaning. So, you know, just to give, give an example, uh, which I think uh, the authors uh, mention as well, you know, um, the fact that we, when we keep kosher, separate milk and meat is based on a line in the text that really has nothing to do with separation of milk and meat. You know, you may not see the kid in its mother's milk. Um, which was probably an expression. It occurs, I think, three times in, in, in the Torah. And, uh, and, and, um, and, and they're not necessarily even mentioned in the context of, of kosher laws, but that's the interpretation that we have given it. And it becomes a central piece of, if you're gonna keep kosher, you go, you're not gonna eat, uh, eat um, cheeseburgers. Um, so, uh, so in other words, it is through our, through our commentary uh, and through our tradition that we read the text and we, uh, and we, have, a, um, and we have, have a tradition. Um, so we um, uh, have to ask, what do the texts mean to us? And, and generally we do not ask, what did they mean originally? Um, and that becomes very, very important. What did the, the writers of a particular book, what did they mean when they, when they wrote the text? Because in many ways, both for Christians and for Jews, the text, the Bible is not a novel. The no, text is not a, a, a um, uh, is, is also not nonfiction. It's not something that we read and we put aside that we've learned something from. It is a text that is supposed to remain forever relevant that we can read this ancient text and it speaks about how we're supposed to, um, how we're supposed to, uh, to live. Um, and for, for us, for Jews, uh, in many ways, the relevance of that text has to do with how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to behave, which is very different from how Christians look at the text because the text is there to teach how to, 
um, uh, uh, to teach theology and what proper belief is. Um, I know a number of years ago, I gave a, I gave a class on um, uh, end of life issues. Uh, I don't remember if any of you were, were there, about a dozen people sat around the table and I asked everybody, um, why are you here? What, what prompted your interest? And as we went around the table, uh, a similar theme uh, emerged and the theme was, you know, I have elderly parents or I'm responsible and I want to know how, what I'm supposed to do. What am I supposed to do uh, from a Jewish point of view? And I thought to myself about that and I thought, you know, if we were at the Portland Christian Center, which is the church right next to the large church right next to the synagogue, and the pastor there had a similar class and taught, uh, and, and taught a class on end of life, and there were a dozen people who sat there and they asked them, why are you here? I don't think the answer would be, I want to know what I'm supposed to do. I think overwhelmingly the Christian answer would be, I want to know what I'm supposed to believe. Uh, and that's a very, very big, uh, big difference. And it's a big difference in terms of how we read the, um, um, how we read uh, the, the, uh, the texts. Um, so um, uh, what, what, what they're going to do, what uh, Amy Jill Levine and Mark Svee Brettler are, are, are going to do is they're going to take us on a journey and we're going to read the uh, text, uh, and they've chosen specific texts. We're not reading through the whole Bible, we're reading specific texts and specific texts from which Christians derive beliefs and theology. Um, and um, uh, for instance, um, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of original sin, which comes from uh, Christian theology, really comes from the story of Adam and Eve. Um, and for us, we read that story and we don't read original sin, but original sin is, is really basic to, to um, Christian, um, uh, Christian belief and Christian, uh, Christian theology. Um, so we're going to read um, uh, the text as it's understood um, through, the, through the view of the New Testament. Or maybe you're going to read the New Testament and read back where the idea comes from, from, uh, from the uh, Hebrew scripture. Uh, we're going to read the original. Well, that's the idea to read the original. And what did the original mean? What was the original intent? And then we're also going to read what did Jews do with that text? How did Jews embellish, change, alter the text so that it it no longer means what, what it may originally have, um, ha have meant. Um, so we mean different things as, you, as I began with um, uh, President Biden's Bible. Uh, when we talk about the Bible, uh, we mean different things. It sounds, you know, we should have in a Judeo-Christian uh, society, I'm not happy with that term, but I'm going to use it anyway. In, in, a, in a society that is overwhelmingly uh, Christian, whether they are believing or not, and uh, where, where I'm going to add us in, even so we're just this tiny little uh, little speck in that in that group in terms of numbers, um, we should have a universe of language when we talk about the Bible. Um, and yet, um, uh, you know, so the Catholic Bible not only has the Old Testament and the New Testament, but what they consider the Old Testament is not what we consider uh, the, um, uh, the Bible. So which books are included, which languages, and there's a whole long uh, and interesting um, issue of how were certain books chosen and, how were, and certain books were left out, purposefully left out. There were long discussions. Uh, for instance, uh, the book of Shir Hashirin, the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs is a book of erotic poetry. <laughs> um, and it, it's in, entirely secular. God is not mentioned anywhere in Shir Hashirin. Um, 
And the question is, why would you take a book of erotic uh, poetry and include it in the Bible? Uh, and there were many, um, uh, during the discussions, there were those who said, no, 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 leave it out. It doesn't belong there. Um, and I think it was Rabbi Akiva who, um, uh, first of all, who said, it begins Shir Hashirim Asher Li Shlomo. It is the Song of Songs of Solomon. Well, if it's connected to Solomon, it has certain a certain value. And then, they, then what they did is they said, this is not erotic poetry. This is um, uh, a, a, a continuing story of the love between God and the people of Israel. That's what this, what this book is really all about. It gets included. Um, the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, which I think is a fabulous, interesting book, um, but the book of Ecclesiastes challenges all of the, the standard norms. It challenges the norms of, 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 um, of righteousness. You know, and the whole idea, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, there's all kinds of things in uh, Ecclesiastes that you say, this is Judaism. Well, or the book of Job. Uh, by the way, Job is not Jewish. Uh, so there were, there were books that were chosen to be included and books that were chosen not to be included, to, to be excluded. Uh, so for instance, the book of Maccabees, there's a book of Maccabees one and two, that it was decided not to include them. Uh, probably because the rabbis found that the Hasmoneans, who were the descendants of the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans became power hungry and corrupt. And there was no desire to, um, uh, to glorify them. Um, so in fact, the original Hebrew of the book of Maccabees no longer exists. It probably was written in Hebrew. And the earliest form of the book of Maccabees that we have is Greek. And it's included in a collection called the Apocrypha. And it's in the Catholic Bible, but it's not in our Bible. So how, um, how books got included or didn't get included uh, is, uh, is a whole very interesting, um, interesting subject. Um, you know, of course, we, uh, whenever I teach, uh, go to, um, to, co to college to give an introduction to Juda Judaism, I speak about the idea of the Old Testament. Right? And I talk about the fact that uh, we Jews don't call it the Old Testament. We don't call it the Old Testament because if I say this is my old shirt, you have to assume that I have a new shirt. <laughs> and um, if I just say this is my shirt, you don't know anything about my, my wardrobe. Um, and usually uh, a new shirt comes to replace an old shirt. Um, that's true in everything except for wine. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, and in fact, when you call it the Old Testament, in fact, in Christian theology, the New Testament really comes to, uh, to in many ways, replace the Old Testament or be the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So even what we, uh, what we call it, and they, they have um, uh, in, in the book, um, they have trouble the saying, you know, we call our Bible, the Masoretic text, we call it the Tanakh. The word Tanakh is not a Hebrew word. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you see it in Hebrew above the, uh, between the second and the third letter, there are little um, um, diacritical marks. Diacritical. Uh, and that's to indicate that it's not really a word. We say Tanakh, but it stands for the three sections, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, the three sections of, uh, of, the, uh, of the text, which are the first five books, which is the Torah, the next books, which are known as Nevi'im or prophets, which includes six historical books and 15 books named after prophets. And then we have a section called Ketuvim, which are writings, uh, which includes Psalms and Proverbs and Job and, uh, um, and the five Megillot, um, the, five, the five scrolls. So, uh, um, uh, you know, um, 
so they prefer the term scriptures of Israel. They don't even like the term uh, Hebrew Bible because there are certain aspects of the Bible, of the Torah, where the terms that are used are really not Hebrew. Uh, many of them in the book of Daniel are Aramaic. Uh, and so to call it the Hebrew Bible, which I think is perfectly fine, I use that regularly, uh, is a misnomer. And so they prefer to use the scriptures of Israel. Whatever term you use, the point is that, you know, when we talk about, about the, the Bible, uh, it's, um, um, and uh, uh, she says, even in, I refer to her because I know who Amy Jo Levine is. I really don't know Mark V. Brettler. Um, uh, but uh, she says that even the, the, um, the order of the books speaks to the overall purpose. That, um, you know, even in the Christian Bible, the order of the books is different. So for example, um, the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth in our Bible is in a collection called the Five Scrolls, the Five Megillot, which include the Song of Songs, Ruth, uh, Ecclesiastes, um, um, uh, Esther, Prophets. and... Um, Prophets. Uh, Prophets. And, and which? Prophets. No. Uh, no, and uh, no the the the, the book of, of um, why am I losing uh, of uh, the I'll get to it. Uh, <laughs> but the book of Ruth is put in this in this collection. In the Christian Bible, the book of Ruth comes right after the book of Judges. Why? Because in the in the in the uh, in the very beginning of the book of Ruth, it says in the days when the judges judged. And so therefore, it was, it's put um, there in the, in the, um, in the, in the book of, uh, of, of um, uh, in that order. Uh, but she says this, or they say that there's something even more important because the prophets, which for us is put in the middle of the, of the, of the text, the prophets in the Protestant Bible are really put at the end, so the last book is the book of Malachi or Malachi, um, which uh, predicts at the very end the return of Elijah and the Messiah. So, uh, so here you have the end of the Old Testament is now a prediction of the of the coming of the uh, of, of the Messiah, which is exactly the proper lead-in to the. Uh, uh, the Christian scriptures. Um, whereas, anybody you know what's what's uh, what's our last book of the Bible? Chronicles. Chronicles. Chronicles one and Chronicles two, which is a rehash of the books of um, of Kings, uh, and it's a hist it's a retelling of the um, uh, of the history. Uh, so there's no theology in terms of um, the order of our books and and where they're um, where they're going. Next subject. Um, the Bible is considered, certainly for us, the first five books in particular, but the Bible is considered divine. It came from God. And therefore, it is perfect. If it's perfect, uh, there are no errors, there are no mistakes, there are no redundancies. Um, and uh, so we get from that the whole idea of inerrancy. Um, uh, that's it. Thank you. Lamentations. Um, uh, thank you, Helen. The, is, is, uh, no, don't mean is the fifth. Don't lament over and Anthony. Um, uh, is, is the fifth is the fifth uh, Megillah. Um, so. Um, uh, so, so what, ha what happens when it appears that there are contradictions? It becomes the, the role of the, um, of the interpreter to prove that there are no contradictions, that there it is not mistake. So for example, easy example, it says in 
uh, in Genesis that Noah took how many of every kind of animal? Two. Two. Two, Two right? Male and female. Yes, it says that. And then go to chapter six to chapter seven. And it says that he took seven pairs of every kind of clean animal and one pair of every unclean animal. Well, did he take two or did he take seven pairs? And by the way, what's an a clean animal or an unclean animal in, in, the, in, the, um, in the early chapters of Genesis? We don't really know. Uh, but this became a, a problem for, um, um, for people who, who were interpreting to say, how many animals of every kind did he take? And they, they uh, come up with a um, uh, with the proof that both are correct. In fact, after the flood, what does Noah do? Noah offers sacrifices. If he sacrificed the animals that were on the on the uh, on the ark, he would be destroying species. Couldn't happen. So therefore, uh, in fact, Noah took seven pair of every clean animal, which could be used for sacrifices, and one pair of unclean animal. And that solves the apparent, apparent contradiction. Uh, and there are a myriad of, uh, of re redundancies, contradictions that, uh, that we need to yeah. So, but, um, so that's um, uh, one view of the Bible and it's an important one, it's important one for us Jews as well. Uh, but they speak, she also, uh, they speak in here about higher criticism, also known as a documentary hypothesis. People familiar with, uh, with higher criticism or documentary hypothesis, very important. Um, in the 19th century, there were Christian scholars who um, developed, uh, the most famous name is a guy named Wellhausen, but there was a whole, a whole slew of them, um, who uh, made a very uh, heretical uh, assumption. Their heretical assumption was that what we have in, in, the, in the Bible is different uh, versions of texts that were put together that were redacted. And mm -hmm. matter of fact, they talk basically, uh, even though it's got more complicated, about four different, different sources that were merged together. Um, so the earliest sources, and, and what's earliest and what's late is an interesting subject. The earliest sources are the Elohut and the Yahweh sources, otherwise known as E and J. So, um, and, and uh, she talks in, in the, in, in, or they talk in, in the book about the two creation stories. There's the creation story in Genesis 1, uh, which is the... Um, which is the, the E source, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's the E source, um, which is the story which we're very familiar with that God created the world in seven days, created uh, Adam and Eve on the, on the sixth day and rest on the seventh day. Right? We have each of those days. We're all familiar with the first chapter of Genesis. This ch the second chapter, which begins with chapter two, verse four or five, is a whole different version of creation. That's right. In that version, if you read it carefully, human beings were created first. What? Adam was created first, not at the end. Um, and it's uh, only later that everything else is, is created. Uh, in, the, in the first version, Adam and Eve were created simultaneously. God created male and female together. And the second version, we all know what happens in the second version? Adam's rib. Adam's rib. The yeah. first time that God says that something is not good is when God realizes that Adam is alone. And therefore he does, uh, you read the text very carefully. God does something very, very strange. He decides that Adam is alone. And now he brings to Adam all these different animals to see which one can become a partner. None of them work. That's a failure. So as a result, uh, we have this the story of um, 
of a rib being taken and we don't really know if it's a rib. I've heard other interpretations as well. Um, a, a bone is taken from Adam's body and from Adam's body, a female is created. So it's a, it, and that is the J version. So um, we have different versions of the same story over and over again. We're told different versions of the, um, of the, of the same, same story. Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, when uh, Abraham is told that he's going to have a son, he's going to have a child. He's already 99 years old. His wife is 90. And somebody laughs. Who laughs? Sarah. Sarah. Sarah laughs. That's the story that, that we're all told. Sarah is hiding behind in a, in a tent. She hears that she's going to become pregnant and she laughs. Um, and then she denies it. She said, no, 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 I didn't, I didn't, I didn't laugh. Uh, well, if you just go to the chapter just before that, the same story is told, except it's Abraham who laughs. Um, so uh, we have um, uh, many stories where the story is actually told twice. Um, we have one story, as a matter of fact, that's told three times, but uh, that's a whole, a whole other thing. So uh, this was a theory that uh, becomes known as the documentary hypothesis that these were documents that uh, passed down during tradition. And at a certain point they become, they are redacted. And they're redacted in a very um, interesting way. Um, now I must tell you that if we were to sit here with several versions of Goldilocks and the uh, and the three bears, is it Goldilocks and the three bears? If we had, had several different versions, and now we we're going to write the authoritative version, we would somehow eliminate the contradictions. However, uh, with these documents, they are religious texts; they can't be played with. So therefore when they were redacted, the contradictions were left right in there. And they're done so amazingly that you don't even feel it often when you read the text. So when you read the first chapters of Genesis, we know the story, but we don't have the sense really that it's two different versions of the creation story. Um, so uh, I mentioned this because uh, although um, Christian interpretation and Jewish interpretation, traditional Jewish interpretation, talk about the text being somehow perfect. Um, the, um, uh, we have to understand, uh, uh, because it's divine, that there are different versions. And um, um, where do we see that best in terms of the New Testament? In the, in the Christian scriptures, the, we see it best in the first four books, four because we have the four books of the Gospels, um, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, they don't tell the same story. They're all telling the story of, of Jesus' life, and there are contradictions there between them. Um, was Jesus, was the Last Supper a Passover Seder, or wasn't it a Passover Seder? Well, it, it appears that three of the Gospels say it was, one of the gospels says it wasn't. Um, so here again, very clearly, uh, there are uh, there are contradictions, and the and the the job of the interpreter, who takes upon him or herself the idea that this is a perfect text, is to somehow explain what the these contradictions. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, they call it in the book a tapestry uh, by many different weavers. So I think it's a very, uh, very beautiful um, idea. Um, next idea that, uh, that she talks about, or they talk about in the book, is ambiguity. Um, and why is the text ambiguous? Well, it's ambiguous for a lot of different reasons. First of all, we all know that the Hebrew uh, Bible contains no vowels, no punctuation. There are no capitals um, uh, in, 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 in Hebrew. 
um, sometimes letters are, and it was all transcribed, not by printing press, but all transcribed to this day by scribes. Scribes make errors. Um, and sometimes letters appear the same. Uh, so the difference between the letter Resh and the letter Dalid is sometimes can be, uh, they can be entered, in, in, one can um, write one. As a matter of fact, there's a whole interpretation, you know, uh, you're supposed to, when you recite the Shema, you're supposed to uh, emphasize um, uh, the first word and the last word. Because um, uh, I'll just point out the last word. The last word is echad. Right. But if the last word, instead of a dalit, were a resh, it would be acher. So in other words, it would be here, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is other. No, 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 no. That's not, no we have to, when you say it, you have to really pronounce the dalit. It can't possibly be a resh. Um, I don't know if any of you were, were there a number of years ago when um, uh, we had a sofer come to the synagogue and I invited um, people to bring uh, mezuzah scrolls if they wanted them to be checked. Um, and a few people did. So the sofer sat there and he looked at the, you know, it's very tiny writing in a, in a mezuzah scroll, very tiny, uh, tiny writing. He's looking to see that everything is, is correct. And at a certain point he stops he calls over one of our Hebrew school kids who happened to be there, and he points to a letter. And he says, "What is that letter?" So I got uh, I got nervous. You know, uh, does this child know uh, know the Hebrew letters well enough? And the, and the child declared what the what he said the letter was, and the sofer took his knife and he cut the, uh, um, the sort of shocking to everybody. He cut the scroll in half, and they were, "Oh my goodness, what happened?" Well. What the kid said was the wrong letter. And that's what the sofer was checking. For instance, a yud is a very small letter. A vav is a full size letter. And a final nun is the same. They all look the same except for the size. So if you have a scribe who's writing, writing the letter and he writes a yud and it's a little long, it looks like a vav or the, or the reverse. If he has a vav and he makes it too long, it looks like a final nun. Um, so when everybody was sort of shocked at, at his taste, he said, listen, I didn't ask any of you to bring the texts here, but if you bring them to me, I'm an expert. And if a kid tells me it's the wrong letter, he says, I know what the letter is supposed to be. So I can, um, uh, I can fudge it. But if a kid who, um, comes and he tells me it's the wrong letter and it's the wrong letter, boom, it's pasul, it can't be used. Um, so we have, um, uh, uh, and we have issues of transmission. How did, how did, did this over the centuries get transmitted from one generation to the, um, uh, to the other? Uh, and then of course, how is the text understood over time? Those of you with, with, with the book, uh, um, go to page 25. If I knew how to do it, I would put it up on the screen, but I don't, I don't know how to do it. So on page 25, you'll see that James Kugel, who's a um, Harvard Bible scholar that actually came to Nebuchadnezzar Shalom um, when um, uh, Rabbi Stanford's class was studying uh, Kugel's uh, book. Uh, he has four rules mm -hmm. about how scripture traditionally was understood. Yeah. So the first rule is the Bible is a fundamentally cryptic text. Thus, texts need not mean what they obviously seem to mean. Now that's very confusing. He's saying you can read the text. You think you know what the words mean. That doesn't mean what the words mean. <laughs> right, let me read it again. The Bible is a fundamentally cryptic text. Thus, texts need not mean what they obviously seem to mean. Okay? This is both for Jews and Christians. He's using this as rules for how Jews read the Bible. Uh, rule number two. Scripture constitutes one great book of instruction, 
and as such is a fundamentally relevant text. Not only relevant when it was written, it's relevant today. Even were a prophet speaking to his generation, he's not speaking only to his generation. Further, the text may indeed, um, uh, further the text may indeed must be reinterpreted to remain relevant. In other words, you have um, Amos, who's speaking ab uh, about war and whether the people should go to war or, or, or not. Uh, and he gives a prophecy, a, well, that prophecy is not only about, uh, about uh, the time of Amos, uh, it's about today. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about collapsed history in, in, in a minute. Um, so that becomes a very important, important idea that the book, um, you know, when, when we read an old book, we say, ah, oh, it was, you know, this is Western education. Western education is a big aspect of Western education is we put things sort of in a time frame. If something was written, if something was written a hundred years ago, um, well, you know, what was going on a hundred years ago? What were the influences on the, on the, on the writer? That's not how the Bible is traditionally understood. The Bible remains relevant. Number three, which can be very, I mean, we, we do that today when rabbis give sermons, when ministers give sermons and they quote the Bible, they are quoting the Bible to say that the Bible has something to say about today. Uh, now that can be very dangerous because there are a lot of different contradictory positions in the Bible. Number three, scripture, this is what we talked about before. Scripture is perfect and perfectly harmonious. Consequently, texts that appear to be contradictory are not. It is the interpreter's job to make them comport. It's, it's our job uh, as, uh, as an interpreter to explain to everybody that, they're, that it's entirely consistent. Um, okay, so scripture is perfect and perfectly harmonious. Uh, and the last principle is all of scripture is somehow divinely sanctioned of divine providence or divinely inspired. Therefore, scripture language is not quotidian, quotidian human language. When a friend says, I'll meet you in 70 minutes, she expects you to be waiting in 70 minutes. But when God says through a prophet, you will be restored in 70 years, that could mean 490 years. Okay, so it can be in, interpreted. And she gave an example, I think, from the book of Daniel, where the word 70 uh, becomes, becomes 490. So you put these four principles together and, uh, and you get all kinds of different, um, of different uh, uh, principles. But Jews use these principles and Christians have used these principles in different ways for different purposes. Um, uh, they talk about the, uh, the biblical text being omni, uh, omni-significant. Mm -hmm. It was omni uh, The Jews can, uh, can take one text and we don't have trouble interpreting it in, in several different ways um, at the same time. Uh, now that's only in, in one area and that's in the area of of stories and theology, but it cannot be omnisignificant in the area of halakha, in the area of observance. Because e I have to decide either something is the right way to behave or the wrong way to behave. Um, and that becomes a very important aspect of, uh, of Talmudic writing. Um, but um, we can have omnisignificance in a lot of different, um, so another quotation from, from, the, from the text. Jewish biblical interpretation has no, simp has no single point or goal. Christian interpretation sees Jesus as the main theme of the Old Testament. That's very important. So when we, we read the text, we simply read the text. 
but when um, but when this woman that I, I told you about uh, at the very beginning who said to me, and weren't you convinced? Um, uh, her, her feeling and, and a very central part of Christian theology is that the, the main theme of the Old Testament is to prove the, um, the, um, uh, the rebirth that that Jesus the uh, the divinity of Jesus. Um, and we're going to see that as we get into into different chapters uh, of of that. Um, so what do we use? What do we um, you know? In, in many cases, the, the Christians use the New Testament as a uh, proof proof text of the Old Testament. You know. The Old Testament proves this in, in, the, in the New Testament. What do we use? So uh, all of these um, um, uh, words that uh, to some of you, I think are very familiar, to others may not be familiar. And that is, first of all, uh, the Mishnah, the, uh, which uh, leads to the Talmud. Uh, uh, we have Midrash. Um, we have a commentary. Uh, starting with um, uh, the, uh, the most important commentator is Rashi, who lives in the 11th century northern France, uh, to the point where she talks about the, the idea of pardes. Now, the word, par word pardes is really a Persian word. In, uh, in Hebrew, it means an orchard. Um, uh, and, uh, but uh, again, when it's written, so that the letters, the four letters of Pardes, Pe, Resh, Dalit, Samach, uh, are written with two little uh, marks over the two last letters. It means it's standing for something. So what are the levels of interpretation? Well, the first level of interpretation is Pshat. What is the simple meaning of the text? Now, what you and I think of the simple meaning of the text is not necessarily what tradition thinks of as the simple meaning of the text. So there's Pshat, there's remez, which means hints. What does the text hint at? It's a whole other level. Drash, what kinds of lessons can we learn from the... Uh, and then the last level is the samach is sod, is secret. Um, so we have um, all this interpretation is part of our tradition. Um, so um, an, um, uh, two more important quotes that um, uh, page 31, uh, they say the Bible itself is less important in Judaism than the Bible interpreted. Think about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. The Bible itself is less important in Judaism than the Bible interpreted. Um, if you're all familiar with the um, uh, with our when you come to synagogue on Saturday morning or on a holiday morning, you're given a prayer book and you're given a uh, a biblical text. The biblical text contains within it um, contains within it the text of the Torah that we're about to read from the scroll. Um, so so what do we have? We have first of all. Uh, what's what's there? First of all, there's the Hebrew text itself. Next to it is a translation. Translations are always cheating. Understand that translations are always cheating because translations um, interpret the text. They have a lot of a lot of leeway in interpreting the text. Uh, my favorite example for that is in. Um, it's a bad example, but I'll give it anyway. <laughs> Eskimo, uh, in the Eskimo language, there are five terms for snow. Mm -hmm. We have one word for snow. So if I'm going to turn and translate something from Eskimo into English, I have to use the word snow, but I've lost all of the nuance that someone has used by using one of the five, one of these five terms. Um, same thing in reverse. If I'm translating from English to, uh, to Eskimo and the word snow comes up, now I have to use one of these five terms. And actually one of the five terms is going to, 
is uh, uh, each of those words for snow means something different. Translate that now not into something as normative as snow, as to ideas. Um, you know, how does our Pledge of Allegiance end? With liberty and justice for all. What in heaven's name does liberty mean? What does justice really, really mean? How are you gonna translate that into another language? Is there a word that really has the same nuance? Probably not in another language. So translations are always, are always cheating. So there's the text, there's a translation, and then below the translation are two commentaries with a line in between. Mm -hmm. The one, the top translation is supposedly shot. What is the simple meaning of the text? And the one below is actually drosh. How has this text been understood in Jewish tradition throughout the centuries? Um, how we interpreted the text. So we always read the text. Uh, you go to an Orthodox synagogue, you get a chumash with a commentary. You go to a reform synagogue, you're gonna get a chumash with a commentary. That's how Jews read the Bible. We always read the Bible with, now the commentaries may differ, but we always read the text. So that line, the Bible itself is less important in Judaism than the Bible interpreted. Um, uh, and here it says uh, uh, on page 32, showing how the Old Testament foresees the new is central to Christian interpretation. This is the same idea again. Correct doctrine was and is more important in Christianity than in Judaism. Orthodoxy is correct belief is paramount in Christianity. By the way, when we call, we divide Orthodox conservative and reform, Orthodox is the wrong term. The right term is orthoprax. Um, that orthodoxy is focused on correct behavior, orthoprax. Not orthodox. Orthodox means correct belief. Um, so here again, showing how the Old Testament fores foreshadows the New Testament is central to Christian interpretation. That's a very, very important idea. And if we don't focus on that idea, we won't understand the rest of the book. Um, correct doctrine, correct belief is more important in Christianity than in Judaism. Um, uh, so I'll, uh, I'll often tell, uh, tell people, uh, you know, if someone comes to me and it's happened at, uh, often, often at a dinner party. We haven't had dinner parties in a long time. Uh, uh, but at a dinner party where someone will point out and say, you know that guy over there? He's a rabbi. So uh, the person will come over, to, uh, come over to me, make his way over and say, well, rabbi, I'm Jewish, but I don't believe in God. So what are you going to do about that, rabbi? <laughs> Um, so my answer, which is not uniquely mine, is tell me about the God you don't believe in. <laughs> because I probably don't believe in that God either. But I'm not going to, but I think a, um, a, uh, a priest or a minister, if someone comes and says to a priest or minister, I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Lutheran, um, and I don't believe in God, I think the answer must be, if you don't believe in God, you can't be a Baptist or you can't be a Lutheran because the assumption is that if you say, I don't, that if you say you're Lutheran, that you accept certain basic doctrines, certain beliefs, which is absolutely central. So I often tell the, uh, tell the story that, um, uh, and many of you may have been there. I was chicken on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. I did it on the second day of Rosh Hashanah many years ago. And I asked everybody, if you believe in God, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. What do you think happened? 
I think, first of all, it was a very strange question for Jews. <laughs> one third of the hands went up, mm -hmm. one third of the hands didn't move, and one third of the hands went. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, because, uh, and uh, in the Portland Christian Center, if the, if the uh, minister had said, everybody who believes in God, raise your hand, every hand has to go up because your hand doesn't go up. You're not a Christian. You're, you know, the question is, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, for Jews, you know, you may not believe in God, but you may be here for all kinds of reasons, including you like the Kiddush. Um, uh, and, and if you say, I don't believe in God, but I'm Jewish, that's not a contradiction in terms. Uh, I can, but it is for, Christ, for Christians. Mm -hmm. So again, showing how the Old Testament foreshadows the New Testament is central to Christian interpretation. Absolutely central. Correct doctrine is more important in Christianity uh, than in Judaism. Orthodoxy, in other words, proper belief, correct belief, is paramount in Christianity. Now, it's important for us to really understand that because without understanding that, without accepting that, we can't understand uh, the Christian interpretation of, um, of, of the text. Um, we're almost out of time. I just wanna, wanna point out a couple of things. I thought I would do chapter two as well, but we'll get to that uh, later. Um, there are terms that, that they use in the book that she doesn't define or doesn't define really well. The first one is the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Bible um, that was done under the Ptolemies in Egypt, where by tradition, 70 rabbis were invited to come to Egypt and translate the Bible into Greek and that became the Septuagint. It becomes very, very important because as they translated the Bible, a translation, what is a translation? It's already an interpretation. Um, but it's the, it's, um, uh, Christians use the Septuagint as their authoritative version of the Bible rather than the Hebrew original. Mm -hmm. uh, and that becomes very important. And it becomes important for us to understand how the Bible was understood by those rabbis at that time. These were, were Jews who interpreted it. Um, the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are 14 books and the meaning of the word Apocrypha means to be hidden away. So the Apocrypha were books that were outside the biblical canon. They were Jewish books. The book of Tobit, uh, the book of Maccabees. There are 14 different books. The book of Judith are all books that may have been originally written in Hebrew. We don't have the original Hebrew anymore because the, who kept those books? The church maintained those books. They are Jewish books. And therefore, the ideas in them are important. Even so, they were not part of the canon. What does canonization mean? Canonization was a decision. We can't hold on to the whole library. We got too many things. So we're going to canonize certain texts. And we're going to say, these are the texts. And the rest, whatever happens to them, happens to them. Well, some of them were preserved by the church. And those are the Apocrypha. And those are the books that are included in the Catholic uh, Old Testament. So that's the book of the Apocrypha. There's also something called the Pseudepigrapha. Uh, the Pseudepigrapha are, uh, and the word pseudo means spurious. Um, so the Pseudepigrapha are books that are written, to, are ascribed to various biblical characters that, the, that they didn't write. Now we also have other books, right? Um, um, uh, um, Priscilla, in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the text, in the, in the lecture the other day, um, uh, the uh, rabbi talked about the book of Psalms being written by David. 
David didn't write the book of Psalms. Mm -hmm. He may he may have written, written some Psalms, but he didn't write 150 Psalms. Um, so we have already in the Bible, we've attributed certain books to certain people. Um, uh, and um, so the pseudepigrapha are books that were attributed to early biblical characters that they clearly didn't write, but they were probably all Jewish, Jewish books. Um, uh, the, um, uh, she refers to Philo. Philo was an Egyptian uh, Jewish philosopher uh, who lived in Alexandria. Alexandria was the greatest Jewish community. And uh, Philo becomes important because uh, he interprets biblical text uh, for the first time as, uh, as metaphor. Um, uh, so his interpretations, he's Jewish. He didn't know Hebrew. So what's he using when he looks at the Bible? He's using the Septuagint as his, his interpretation. He's using the Greek translation. <laughs> Finally, the last thing that, uh, that I think she mentions is are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I think you're all familiar sort of, um, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls were um, um, scrolls that were discovered originally by um, a little, um, by a young um, shepherd boy um, who was throwing rocks. And at a certain point in the town of, in, in Qumran, which is right near the Dead Sea, he, uh, the rocks hit something that sounded uh, not like solid earth. And, and he looks in the cave and here he finds um, containers with very old texts in them. Uh, and he takes these, uh, these texts, um, he doesn't know what they are, of course, and he, um, he takes them to some merchants in the old city in Jerusalem. He sells them for virtually nothing, and they are some of the oldest versions of biblical texts that we, that we have. So that uh, those of you who've been to Israel and been to the Hebrew, uh, been to the um, uh, uh, museum, the Israel Museum. Uh, the centerpiece when you get there is a, is a building uh, that looks like this um, on the outside and it contains scrolls of the Old Test, of the, of the, um, um, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and they become very important because we see there how from, uh, from the time, from 2000 years ago, how certain texts were transmitted. And it also contains certain texts that without knowing about the Dead Sea Scrolls, we would never, uh, never know about. There's still a lot of questions about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the community that lived in Qumran. Who were these people? Uh, why were they living there in, in the middle of the desert? Um, were they Pharisees who, um, who ran away from Jerusalem because of the Romans? Were they a group called, uh, were they Essenes? Who were they? And why were they keeping these uh, these these texts in these? So that becomes uh, becomes very important. So my suggestion is that if you found the first chapter confusing, read it again. <laughs> look, at, look, at, look at the first chapter again. We will do both chapter two, which I think is very very short, um, and go right into chapter three next uh, next, next time. Anybody have any questions? I do. Comments. Yeah. Yep. I have a question about something in chapter two. Should I save it for next week? Sure. No, well, throw it at me. Okay. On page 57, it talks about Jewish texts saying derogatory things about the Mes Jesus. And I, how did that happen if they were written? When were they written? I guess is my question because Jesus didn't exist when the Bible was written. Right. Uh, well, you know, as, as Judy, he's talking about they're talking about commentary, um, and uh, uh, Judaism and Christianity now get into uh, uh, controversy with each other about ideas. There's pressure on Jews to become Christians, and so there are um, so Jews develop polemics against against Christianity. 
So this is from the, from, from the um, uh, it can happen from any time after, um, uh, after, the, after the fourth century uh, when the Roman empire becomes Christian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, so, yes, it's not anachronistic that the Bible talks about, uh, mm -hmm. about, about Jesus um, uh, long before Jesus, long before Jesus lived. Um, so it's, it's, it's only later text. Uh, anybody else? This is a question. Advisory, Rabbi, um, I am using the audio book. And the audio book doesn't indicate pages. Oh. So it's going to be an interesting study. Okay. <laughs> We will not re refer to the to the uh, the book directly very often. I just wanted to refer uh, about those um, four principles from from Google. I'll try try not to because I assume other people are uh, uh, doing uh, oh, the audio as well with an audio book. Uh, I have a question. Yep. Um, I would like okay. to know if do we have any proof texts of anything showing that Jesus existed? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's interesting because in chapter two we get the idea of proof of proof texting, um, but uh, I think that uh, that um, uh, from a Jewish point of view and from that Jesus actually was a human being um, that uh, that existed. What his role was, what he what he did. Um, so I think there really was a historical. Um, okay, person named Jesus. And is it written anywhere? I mean, I'm looking for proof that there was a historical person named Jesus. Is there anywhere that that has been uncovered or written or proven or, you know, talk to us, no. give me the text. All you have to do is read the New Testament. <laughs> I read it. <laughs> I read it. I wasn't convinced. <laughs> uh, but Jews, Jews also, she uh, talks about the fact that, that Jews, um, uh, respond to to the personage of of, of Jesus. Um, so uh, yes, I I think I think the answer is yes. I'll get I'll see if I can get a better answer for you next week. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we're going to stop here. Remember, we're we're um, we're recorded, and next week you'll get a um, another reminder on Wednesday for the um, for this class. Um, again, with the um, um, with the Zoom address, and also uh, how to click onto the onto the recording. So be on your best behavior. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, and uh, you know, and you can eat dinner now at in the dining room. You don't have to eat the dinner in front of in front of the TV. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> okay, until next week. Here. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you Rabbi. Good class. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you.